Open bar? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Just letting it. Did you RSVP with a plus one? Uh, no, I did not. In fact, I didn't realize it was this week because I didn't get my formal invitation. <laughs> And I didn't know what day it was, and then my friend, she called me and said, you going? And I'm like, when is it? And so... So you have to leave early to get a good meal and get an answer after the This is a very different kind of wedding, I think. This is a very orthodox Jewish wedding. Oh, and they know how to party out. They, they, they got, the, they're going to have the booze. But, you know, this is like one of those men and women are separate from each other, like at the place. Yeah, it's very, very, like, very orthodox. So, it's, it's a nice event, but it's not like weddings that I'm used to, you know? Like, you know what I'm saying? But, um, but yeah. No, it'll be nice, though. It'll be really nice. I like, I like, I know the girl is getting married. Okay, so moving on, organic molecules. Organic molecules uh, are not things that were grown without pesticides. <laughs> like we think of organic, right? Like organic produce, organic meat, whatever. Um, organic simply means that something has carbon in it. Right, so any molecule with carbon in it is an organic molecule. And um, also, generally with carbon, as we mentioned before, hydrogen goes along with it pretty, pretty well. Um, we know carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, so it bonds covalently, non-polar covalent bonding, to fill its outer shell. So it can form four other bonds. For single bonds, maybe two double bonds, a double bond, two single bonds, any combination of four. Okay, so organic molecules, as we said, in the body, carbons are linked to form chains or rings. And I just want to kind of, for those of you who have not had like any type of organic chemistry or molecular biology, to understand this, I just I want to briefly kind of explain how that they've drawn this out. Okay, so yesterday or Tuesday we were talking about um, we were talking about you know we drew out our electrons and then we drew a circle to show the bonds and all of that. Well, generally they uh, don't draw things like that. It would take too much space, so they do it in a shorthand way. And so here, what we see is carbon, and it's implied, of course, that the outer shell has four electrons and it shows four single bonds here. Um, likewise, uh, we know carbon and hydrogen, they can be linked together to form a chain like this, or they can be linked together to form a ring like this. If you see a ring like, like this, and there's no C's or H's associated with it, it is implied that at every point, at every point, unless otherwise designated, maybe there might be an oxygen here or something, but in this case, there are no other atoms. At every point, it is implied that there is a carbon there. And of course, if you have a carbon and there are two single bonds here, it is implied that there are two single bonded hydrogens here, unless it's otherwise noted, okay? So, uh, unfortunately, they don't show anything here yet, but I will show you some examples um, later on. But this, this is how carbon and hydrogen are uh, arranged. Because uh, molecules that contain carbon and hydrogen, in order to not have to say carbon and hydrogen all the time, they'll call these molecules hydrocarbon, right? Because hydrogen and carbon are there. Hydrocarbon chains, like this, or hydrocarbon rings, like this. Um, these hydrocarbons serve as a backbone to which more reactive functional groups are added. So when we look at the structure of the macromolecules we're going to be getting into shortly, um, you'll, you'll always see that the area that is bonding with another part of that molecule is always at the functional group. So that's the significance of the functional group. 
So for example, um, we have this right here. This is a functional group. It's carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Uh, and that's called a carbonyl group, carbonyl. And you're gonna find that in things like ketone bodies, which are metabolites of uh, fatty acid metabolism. So when you are metabolizing triglycerides and so forth, um, you will produce ketones and um, carbonyl groups are the functional group in those and also aldehydes. There's also a hydroxyl group, which is um, right here, the gold uh, square here shows an, an oxygen bonded to an, a hydrogen. That's hydroxyl and you're gonna see those in organic alcohols. So we will be talking about um, certain types of alcohols as we talk about metabolism that we make intrinsically. Uh, and then carboxyl groups. These form organic acids like lactic acid and acetic acid, which is basically vinegar. Acetic acid is vinegar, but we do make this as part of our metabolism. Um, lactic acid we make usually in our muscles. You've probably heard of that whenever you're exercising you know, a lot and you start to feel burning. That's in part because of the lactic acid. So carboxyl groups are shown here a carbon double bonded to oxygen and then OH. So I could ask you a question like which of the following functional groups would be found in organic alcohols or in ketones or something like that. Okay, so you should be kind of familiar with this. And um, I again I'm going to point out some of these functional groups when we look at the macromolecules. These are the areas where you're going to have usually bonding with other components of of the, the molecule. Okay, um, stereoisomers. Stereoisomers are atoms. Uh, well, molecules that contain the same atoms that are arranged in the same sequence, but they, dip, they differ in their spatial orientation because sometimes the functional group is on the right side and sometimes on the left side. So if my hand was, say, okay, I guess it's your left side, but it's, yeah, it's my left side. No, it's your right side. Okay. So, so anyway, um, if I held up my hand, my hand was the actual molecule and my thumb was the functional group, okay? We could say that this is a right-handed stereoisomer of a particular molecule. I have the same molecule here with the same atoms but the functional group that's, that's, that's attached to it is on the opposite side, it's left-handed. So these, these molecules are mirror images of each other, right? If they looked at each other, they would look the same, like you're looking in a mirror. But if you tried to superimpose them one on the other, you couldn't because the functional groups are on opposite sides, right? But they are mirror images of each other, but not superimposable. So D isomers, uh, you don't have to know this, but D stands for the Greek term uh, dextrorotatory. These D isomers are right-handed and they will rotate to the right because of that orientation of the functional group. They spin. Molecules usually spin. Um, and that's how they, uh, they are oriented and how they reflect light. L isomers are lever rotatory, they're left-handed. And um, generally speaking in our, in our body, uh, we have one form of certain things or another, but not both. For example, we can use sugars like carbohydrates with functional groups that are right-sided. So we use D sugars, but we can use L amino acids, which make up proteins, okay? So where this can come uh, in, and cause a problem is when you're trying to develop pharmaceutical intervention, okay? So for example, glucose, okay? Glucose is the primary fuel source used by the brain because the blood-brain barrier has real tight junctions and we really only have receptors and transporters for glucose to get things through those cells into the brain. 
So if we had an L sugar, we're not gonna be able to use it but for, with the brain. So likewise, if you're trying to develop a drug that treats, say, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or something like that, you need to make sure that you're using the correct stereoisomer in order to get that through the blood-brain barrier to the brain. For example, you have L-DOPA to treat Parkinson's disease, L-DOPA. That's the stereoisomer form, L. That's why they have that letter there in the front. So it's that left-handed uh, stereoisomer which can cross the blood-brain barrier. Do you have any questions about this? What stereoisomers are? No? All right, well, we're gonna go on next. The last part of this chapter, we're gonna talk about the four major macromolecules. So we talked about atoms, simplest level of organization. We uh, talked a little bit about some small molecules like water, H2O, right? Um, sodium chloride, all of those types of things. Um, but now we're gonna talk about the large molecules, macromolecules, and there are four. What are they? We know one up here. Right. Lipids, you said? Yes. Lipids, what else? Protein. Proteins. Fats. Lipids. Oh, fats, yeah. Okay, lipids, proteins, two more. One's up here. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. And one more. Yeah, DNA and RNA, nucleic acids. Very, very good. That's good. So those are the four, four macromolecules that we have. So carbohydrates first we're gonna talk about. Um, carbohydrates can also be called hydrates, I guess, of carbon. I've read that somewhere. They're organic, they contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, specifically in a one to two to one ratio. So for example, glucose has a chemical formula of C6H12O6, right? So one to two to one ratio, carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So you have six carbons, double the number of hydrogens, and six oxygens, okay? So that's, that is um, the general uh, formula for it. There are monosaccharides, which are simple sugars. In your digestive system, you need to be able to break down any type of large sugar into these simple sugars, these monosaccharides. Otherwise, they won't be able to be absorbed into the bloodstream. They will be too large. Some examples of monosaccharides, of course, mono meaning one, saccharide like saccharin is sweet for sugar. Three examples are glucose, galactose, and fructose. Fructose is fruit sugar. Monosaccharides can bond together covalently to form disaccharides, which are sugars containing two monosaccharides. What kind of bonding would happen between these uh, simple sugars to form disaccharides, do you think? What kind of bonding? Covalent, which one? Covalent, but which type? Nonpolar covalent, the strongest bond type. These are actually really strong molecules. Some examples of disaccharides include sucrose or sugar, table sugar that you can think of. It consists of the monosaccharide glucose and the monosaccharide fructose. Lactose, which is milk sugar, it consists of glucose and galactose. And maltose or malt sugar consists of two glucose molecules bound together. And then if we have long chains of sugars all bonded together, we call it a polysaccharide, poly meaning many, many sugars. There are two very important polysaccharides, uh, which are literally glucose storage molecules. The first one that's listed there, starch, is only found in plants. And if you've ever boiled a potato, you know what starch looks like, right? It's thick and sticky. That is the cells of the potato actually rupturing <coughs> and releasing their starch. That's what's happening when you do that. So 
starch is the storage form of glucose in plants, whereas in humans, we use glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in the human body. And there are two places in the human body where you store glycogen. Does anyone know one, at least? Go ahead, do you have? In your fat cells? Um, not in your fat cells. There you're gonna store fat. You're gonna store triglycerides there. Where? Not the kidneys. You're getting warmer. You're getting closer. Okay, you're like red hot now. Liver. Liver. Yes, the liver. Good, we went through all our anatomy. We went through all our organs. Right, in the liver, right, the liver stores uh, glycogen. In, in fact, uh, if you remember that blood sugar regulation diagram that we had uh, when we were talking about when you have a little blood sugar, I think the right hand side diagram or flow diagram, it actually on that it, it did it did explain that the effector partly was the liver because the liver um, is able to break down glycogen and release glucose into the bloodstream. Okay, so the liver and one other place. Muscle, skeletal muscle, right? We have muscle glycogen for quick energy. And again, we'll talk more about that later, but that's, that's glycogen. Um, they're energy storage molecules. They allow organisms to store thousands of glucose molecules in one polysaccharide, which drastically reduces osmotic problems. So we're, didn't, we didn't talk about osmosis yet, but osmosis is basically the movement of water, right? And so what causes water to go one direction or another direction is uh, solutes, like things like sugars, right? You know if you eat something sweet or salty, you feel like you need a drink, because water always follows that kind of thing. So what would happen is if we had all this glucose floating around in the blood or the tissue fluid, we would get water pooled in all different directions and it would just really mess up the balance inside the body. So the fact that we can store that in glycogen in the liver and in the skeletal muscle reduces these problems. Okay, so formation of disaccharides. It's not just the formation of disaccharides that can happen by way of these reactions we're going to talk about, but the formation of any of these macromolecules that can occur by these two reactions that we're going to describe for you. So the first reaction is known as a dehydration reaction or condensation. A dehydration reaction is one where we bond two molecules together and in the process, we produce water. That's also why it's called, you can use both words. I usually use dehydration, um, but you can use the term condensation as well because you know when something condenses, you know, water is released. And so that's why they call it that as well. But um, dehydration reactions, these are synthesis reactions. We're building a larger molecule from two smaller ones. So if you look at what's in gold here, that's highlighted in gold, we have two glucose molecules. And if you, you take a look, there's um, two hydroxyl groups here, functional groups, right? And this is where the bond is gonna take place. So notice we have two hydrogens and an oxygen, which are gonna be removed and we're gonna form water. The one oxygen stays behind and we're gonna form the bond here between the two, two molecules. So we go from two glucose molecules to making a disaccharide maltose, okay? That's a dehydration reaction. Does this make sense? Anyone have, another, have a question? Okay, the opposite of this is a hydrolysis reaction. We will have the, the suffix lysis many, many times in the course of this class. Lysis, anytime you see that suffix, it means to break apart. 
the first part of the word will tell you what's being broken or what's doing the breaking. And of course here, it's hydro. So this is um, a reaction where we're using water to break a bond. That's what we're doing. So actually, if you wanted this arrow here that's pointing to the right, it really should point to the left to illustrate this. Here we want to take our maltose molecule and we want to break that bond and form two glucose molecules. So our water is going to intercalate itself. It's going to come back in, in with the oxygen that was here and we're going to end up breaking that bond to form the two glucose molecules. That's hydrolysis. We use the water to break apart the bond. Any questions? <laughs> You're like, keep moving, lady. All right, so that's carbohydrates. Uh, lipids, there are several types of lipids, and it's important that you keep them straight and you don't get confused. Lipids, of course, are going to be hydrophobic. Uh, they don't like water, they don't interact with water. We could also say they're nonpolar, um, because hydrophobic and nonpolar are pretty synonymous with one another. Uh, they are insoluble in water. Uh, they consist primarily of hydrocarbon chains and rings. And a lot of people, when you think about when you think about energy, people think, well, we get a lot of ATP energy from glucose, but we really don't get as much energy from glucose as we do from fats. Remember one thing, and when we get into metabolism, this will be easier for you. The energy that a molecule has is basically stored within its bonds. So the more bonds a molecule has, the greater potential you have to produce energy. So glucose is a relatively small molecule relative to a triglyceride. Triglycerides are the major energy storage molecule. We can't use other types of lipids to make energy. We can use triglycerides and these of course, are stored in adipocytes, which we looked at in the lab um, when we looked at adipose tissue. So triglycerides, the two components are actually in the name. We have tri, we have three fatty acid chains and a glycerol molecule. So the glycerol molecule is here, okay? And notice again, what's highlighted in gold, these are the hydroxyl groups. Glycerol is actually an organic alcohol. Generally, if you see an O-L ending in a word, that's an alcohol. So glycerol is an organic alcohol, has hydroxyl groups associated with it. <clears throat> we have carboxylic acid, which is in this light blue. And notice that in the name carboxylic acid, we have carboxyl. And in fact, we have a carboxyl group here as our functional group. So carboxyl group and the hydroxyl groups are going to be the functional groups, and they, they're going to, that's going to be where the bonding happens. The carboxylic acid is attached to these really long chains of carbon and hydrogen, and, um, uh, and that's basically the, the fatty acid part. So it's called a fatty acid because we have carboxylic acid attached to this hydrocarbon chain. So we have hydroxyl group and the hydrogen from the carboxyl group. We're going to combine and then notice that this oxygen that's, that's left is going to be where the bond forms. And this happens three times. To produce three molecules of water and a triglyceride molecule, our glycerol, plus three fatty acids. This line that you see here that's zigzagging, this is the hydrocarbon chain. Remember I told you when you don't see hydrogen or carbon associated with it, because it's a lot to, to write all this out. This is the shorthand. We know that there is a carbon at every single point that you see here, and there are hydrogens that are associated with that. So what kind of a reaction um, caused the glycerol and the three fatty acids to bond together? We just talked non -polar. about. Non-polar. Can the 
what's it called? It, it is nonpolar, but that's not the reaction. Remember the two uh, reactions we just talked about? Just, just dehydration. Left. Dehydration, right? Even it, it says up here, formed by a conden the condensation or dehydration reaction, right, of the glycerol plus the free fatty acid chains. Good. Okay, so getting into uh, some, I guess, properties of triglycerides, the, the fatty acid chains can be either saturated or unsaturated. Okay, so you've heard this, you've heard about saturated and unsaturated fatty acids before. Um, when you look at your food. Uh, so saturated means that hydrocarbon chains are joined by single covalent bonds. So in other words, every carbon has single bonds. They're saturated with single bonds. Unsaturated means that at certain points we have a double bond. So it's not saturated with all of the single bonds and all of the hydrogen, okay? So with an unsaturated fatty acid, we have two types. We have a cis fatty acid and a trans fatty acid. These are defined on the next slide, but I wanted to uh, explain since I have an example of one here. Um, so a cis means the same and trans means opposite, right? Like transatlantic, you go across something. So what they're describing is the orientation of the hydrogen. A cis fatty acid has the hydrogens on the same side of the double bond, okay? A trans fatty acid has the hydrogen on opposite sides, and they don't have one shown here. But instead of the hydrogen being here and here, a hydrogen would be here, and this hydrogen would be on the opposite side. So what's the significance of this? Well, if you have, for example, a saturated fatty acid, there is a lot of room so that the electron clouds around the hydrogen and the carbon are not gonna repel each other. So the fatty acid chain is straight, which means that they can tightly pack on top of each other and cause things like atherosclerosis and inflammation. When you have a trans fatty acid, because the hydrogens are on opposite sides, again, the electron clouds don't really repel each other, and therefore, the chain is gonna stay straight and really is no better for you than a saturated fatty acid would be. However, if you have a cis fatty acid like this, now the hydrogens are so close together, plus you have these double bonds, so there's so many electrons con congesting this area, and of course they're all negatively charged, and like charges repel each other. So what's going to happen at the place where there's a double bond? The chain will kink. It'll get that little zigzag in it, like we saw before. And that means they cannot tightly pack on top of each other, and they don't have as much harm uh, to your body as what the other two types do. So some examples here, saturated fat, fatty acid would be palmitic acid, which is palm oil. Um, and an unsaturated fatty acid uh, down here, which is cis fatty acid, um, which is good for you, would be lineolaic or lineolenic acid, which you find in fish oils. We know that those are good for you. Again, on this slide, it basically tells you what I said about unsaturated fatty acids, the cis type and the trans type. The cis type has the hydrogens um, on the same side of the fatty acid chain, like an oleic acid, which is olive oil. That's the type of acid, fatty acid that you have there. Um, and olive oil, of course, is good for you. Trans fatty acids have uh, double carbons with hydrogens sharing double bonds on the opposite sides, such as elytic acid, which is like um, coconut, oil, I believe. coconut oil. Usually, too, if you look at a saturated fatty acid, those are usually solid at room temperature. Things like um, 
animal fats, for example. Um, you know, we know that like fish oil doesn't usually get fish oil doesn't usually get solid at at room temperature. It usually stays liquid. Um, unsaturated fatty acids are usually going to be liquid at room temperature. So again, like olive oil, for example, tends to be that way. Do you have any questions about that? No. All right, and then we have uh, ketone bodies. And again, when we use triglycerides as energy in our bodies, they are gonna be broken down, and one of the byproducts of this will be ketone bodies. So hydrolysis of triglycerides releases free fatty acids, which can be used for energy. What's hydrolysis? We just talked about. It's a reaction where we use water to break, break apart bonds. So when we hydrolyze a fatty acid, we're releasing that fatty acid chain so that we can break it down and make energy from it. So the, um, again, they can, uh, we use them for energy and we can produce these ketone bodies, uh, which are converted in the liver, uh, again, to ketone bodies, which are acidic. If you have high levels of this, this can cause ketosis or ketoacidosis. If the uh, pH becomes too low. Ke ketone bodies are acidic. So one of the things, like if a person's on the Atkins diet, for example, and they're uh, eating more fat and so forth, they can actually go into ketoacidosis because um, they, they have so much um, ke ketone bodies that they're producing that they can drop the pH pretty significantly. Likewise, if a person is diabetic and they're not utilizing um, blood sugar, instead they can't use their blood sugar because they don't produce insulin or there's another problem, then what you do is you rely on your, your, your fats, which is why people, the turn of the last century, when people were diabetic and they didn't have insulin, they would just become very emaciated because they end up just utilizing all of their fat and they get very, very thin. And they don't feel very well because when you're using your fat, you can go into ketoacidosis. Usually people have um, also sort of a buildup of acetone uh, if they're an untreated diabetic. And acetone is a nail polish remover. People always describe the breath of somebody like that as fruity. I don't really think that nail polish remover smells fruity but I guess there's really no other way to describe it. <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's ketone bodies. Any questions about triglycerides at all? They're big energy storage form, big energy storage molecules in our body. Okay, phospholipids, the next type of lipid that we're gonna talk about. These are not used for energy, but where do you find phospholipids in the body? You find them in gazillions of places, where do you find them? Come on, stay with me. We're almost done. Think. Where do you find phospholipids? Where? No, no. In, in, in fat cells, you're going to store triglycerides. Fat cells store energy. Well, you know, truthfully, you're not wrong. I, you can pretty much say anywhere, huh? Now, I mean, you're really like general, but you can, you're not. I mean, you're not wrong because, yeah. I mean, the stomach is made up of tons of cells, and you find phospholipids making up all plasma membranes of cells. You find phospholipids any membrane that you have, right? Any membrane, all of those organelles within the cell that have membranes, they also are, are gonna be phospholipids. Why are phospholipids such good membrane molecules? Because they have two parts to them. And again, it's in the name. Phos there's a phosphate group and the lipid part. We have a polar phosphate group, which is hydrophilic. 
and we have the nonpolar or hydrophobic fatty acid chain. So we have a phosphate and two fatty acid chains. And what happens is, is that the polar part, the phosphate part can face the water outside the cell or inside the cell. The lipid tails face each other, right? And when you do that, you can form membranes in double layers, right? So that's why we call it a phospholipid bilayer, remember? You forget that? Why did everybody forget the cell? It's like it's amazing to me. And, and the thing is, you know, I had a woman one time that came to me and she's like, we had our quiz on, on uh, the cell or something and she came and she, she had her daughter's like fifth grade biology quiz and she showed me, she's like, look, it's just like ours. I'm like, I know, how's that? <laughs> But still, nobody remembers. I don't know, it's like people wanna block the cell out. It's just, yeah, I guess that's why, you know, we can get this book for so cheap. I guess people just really wanna get rid of them because the memory is too painful just sitting through this. <laughs> it's like, all right. So anyway, phospholipids are found in the plasma membrane of all cells. And they also are something else. They are, they, are also, they are also used as surfactant. Okay, now, remember what a surfactant is? All right, we're batting a thousand today. You were doing good in the beginning. I know, we're almost done. So surfactants are things that break up surface tension. Where do you find it? places like the alveoli of the lungs, right? Because the alveoli <clears throat> does have some water in there and you don't want them to collapse. So you have to break up some hydrogen bonds and reduce the surface tension like we talked about. So how do you do that? You produce these phospholipids. When phospholipids are by themselves, they release and they form these circles. And this of course is like a cross section, but pretty much all the polar heads are gonna be facing the water, all the tails face each other. So you have basically this fat circle. And what happens is, is that the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules are minimized, so you reduce surface tension and the alveolus is going to stay open. So that's what surfactants are. They reduce surface tension. Okay, last lipid is the steroid. And steroids are made from cholesterol. All steroid hormones have cholesterol as a backbone. So here you can see the cholesterol molecule and each one of these has cholesterol. But they're gonna be different based upon their functional groups. So um, you have, for example, here we've got cortisol, which is a stress hormone that we produce in our body. Um, we've got testosterone and estrogen, estradiol. Um, again, they are, you know, they're all cholesterol, but they have some different arrangements of functional groups and atoms, and that's what gives them their different properties and their ability to do different things. So all of them have three six carbon rings joined to a five carbon ring, and cholesterol is a precursor for steroid hormone synthesis. And you also find cholesterol in the plasma membrane again. What lipid makes up the plasma membrane of the cell? Phospholipid. Yes, good. So you did learn something today. Now just keep it in there. Keep it in there. So you can keep it phospholipids because cholesterol helps to increase the fluidity so the phospholipids can move around each other and I have a nice video I'll show you guys after we talk about the cell once we get through chapter chapter three three and six all right well I believe the class is supposed to end at 11:25. am I correct very lying to me it's not no, it's not 11 30 I didn't think it's 11 30. Well, we'll stop here. This, you can put a little mark in your notes that this is where the quiz material will stop for, for next Thursday. And um, again, we'll do review on Tuesday.